Welcome everyone. Now today we're doing another BGCSC paper review. And today we are going to review the biology paper. We're reviewing a paper one. And this is from the year 2018. Now remember always to write your school number, your candidate number, your surname, and your initials. Read through the instructions carefully and also follow the directives given during the examination. Do not open the booklet until you are told to do so. Now let's go to our first question. The first question reads, which term is used to describe the process by which metabolic waste are removed from organisms? And once you're removing waste from the organism, um, you're talking about excretion. So our answer here will be excretion. And please remember that the word metabolic refers to chemical waste or waste from chemical reactions. We're talking about the waste from respiration, for example. All right. And when you respire, you will produce carbon dioxide and water. So those are examples of metabolic waste. Question number two. Now ask which is the correct way of writing the scientific name for the Nassau grouper? Now remember, the scientific name involves two names. You have the genus and the species. But what is important, the genus must be written starting with an uppercase letter, and the species must start with a lowercase letter. So if you look at the options here, you realize that B is the correct answer because the genus is written with the uppercase letter, and the species with a lowercase letter. Okay? All right, so let's jump on to number three. Question number three reads that the diagram below represents a cell which labeled structure is semi-permeable. Now, I already went ahead and labeled the diagram just to save some time. So we're looking for which one is semi-permeable. And the one that is semi-permeable is the cell membrane, which is otherwise called the plasma membrane. And so what is also important here as well, just, for, just to point this out, is that the cell membrane is responsible to allow substances to go in and out of the cell. Okay, so let's move this a little bit. And then I will highlight the answer here, which is this option. So option structure A is the correct answer. All right, so, all right, cell membrane, same thing as the plasma membrane. All right, so we can move on to another question now. Um, let me shift this back a little bit. All right, so everybody get the labeling. So you can look, get the labelings. All right, and so we could move on. All right, excellent. Now, let's go to question number four. All right, and question number four, let me go down. Question number four reads, which is found in a plant cell and not in an animal cell? So what can you find in a plant cell but not in an animal cell? And all cells will have a cytoplasm. Glycogen granules will be in animal cells because um, animals will store their carbohydrates in the form of glycogen. Nucleus is found in almost all cells and starch is what you find in plants and not in animal cells so starch grains will be found in plant cells but not in animal cells all right let's go now to our number five question And number five reads that the diagram show two cells, cell X and cell Y. Now look at the diagram carefully. You realize that cell X is a red blood cell and cell Y is a root hair cell. So you'll find cell Y in a plant. And it's a which is the correct description of their functions. And so let's go into the options. Now for cell X, Option A is to kill germs, which is not correct. And cell Y stores food, not correct at all. B is said that 
cell X produces antibodies, which is not true, and absorb sugar for cell Y, not correct. Cell C, for option C, is it um, cell X transport oxygen, which is a correct uh, answer, and cell Y transport sugar, which is not correct. But option D, transport oxygen, which is a red blood cell, and cell Y is absorbing water because, they are, again, they are the root your cells found in plants, so they will absorb water. So option D is our correct answer. And let's get number six. Number six state, which of the following is a biotic factor in the environment? And remember that the word biotic means Living. So looking for the living factor in the environment. So biotic. Let me just, um, I like that. Biotic means living part. Okay. All right. So a plant life is definitely a living. So I could go ahead and I like that. Rainfall is not living. Soil type is not living. Temperature is not living. Those are abiotic. Okay. Those are abiotic. All right. So I'm going to series this. So um. I'm only talking about the biotic. It looks like I highlight the whole thing. All right. So just biotic is the only part I want to highlight. Biotech. Okay. Excellent. All right. So let's jump on to question number seven. Now, question number seven reads, which is the correct biological term for all of the interconnected feeding relationships in an ecosystem? So all the interconnected. And so all the interconnected Feeding relationship will be a food web. All right. That will be definitely a food web. A feeding relationship could be a food chain. And so the next way to define a food web is an interconnection of food chains. Okay. All right. So going on to question number eight. It said the, the flow diagram show one set of feeding relationship in a pond. And so here you have, let me put a zoom on this. So here you have a pond weed as the first organism. And then it goes to mosquito larvae. And then you have small fish. Then you go to large fish. All right. And so now the question now asks now, it said, at which trophic level is the small fish? Now remember now, trophic level is each level of the food chain so therefore we have our first trophic level will be the pond weed the mosquito is the second so the small fish will be the third trophic level okay so option c will be our correct answer and the large fish will be our fourth so the small fish is definitely the third uh, let's move on to question number nine and question number nine reads, which enzyme can be used to speed up the digestion of fats? And fats are broken down by lipase. And you remember that. And remember, lipase is produced by the pancreas. And it will work in the small intestine. So number nine is C. All right, number 10. Let's jump on to number 10. All right, so number 10 reads, let me put a zoom on this one, zoom in. All right, so number 10 now reads, it said the graph shows the effect of temperature on the rate of enzyme activity in the mouth. And on the y-axis, you have rate of reaction of enzyme. And on the x-axis, you have temperature, which is in degrees Celsius. So now it said at which temperature in degrees Celsius, Will starch be changed to sugar the fastest in the mouth? So looking at the fastest reaction will take place here. So let me draw a line. So this is the maximum, which is the optimal temperature. So if you come all the way down, it will be marked onto 40. So 40 should be our option there. So let's go down to the option and see what the, the answers are. We're looking for 40. So this is definitely D. Okay, so 40 will be our answer there. All right, so let's go to now question number 11. And question number 11 said, which diagram shows an enzyme substrate complex? 
What this means to be enzyme substrate complex is that the enzyme and the substrate will be joined together at the active site. Remember, the active site is where the chemical reaction will take place. So in option A, what we're seeing is the enzyme and the substrate separately. Okay? And so B, they are joined. So B will be our answer. And then for C is where the products will be formed. And I want to point out something right here. Um, if you notice the substrate in black, right, and enzyme in white pretty much. Now, when the enzyme will fit in, the substrate fit into the enzyme by a lock and key fashion, which means that they must have a specific shape to fit there. And in option C is when the substrate break into the smaller portion. Now, this type of reaction, when, when enzyme break down substrate, is called catabolic reaction, okay? Cutting up the substrate into pieces, that's catabolic. Just remember that. Catabolic means to cut up or to break down, okay? All right? And if it was anabolic, you're going to put them together. So this one is catabolic. And just to point that one out, um, number 12, it said the diagram shows the beginning of an experiment on osmosis. The question now is, is which level of salt solution would be shown after three hours? Now, what we need to look at first and foremost here, right, is that you'll see the salt solution inside the potato. So notice the potato cup, which is this here. All right, and then you have the salt solution in the potato. And then on the outside of the potato, you have distilled water. So if the water is distilled on the outside, then what you expect is that water will move from the area where you have more water into the potato cup where you have less water. Because the salt solution inside is more concentrated in terms of solute compared to the outside. So water will move from the outside towards the inside. That's the very important thing. So the solution that the potato is placed in is hypotonic. And so what I want you to notice now, if water going in the potato, that means that the level of salt solution will increase in the potato. Now, what I want you to notice as well is that the original height of the salt solution is here. I'm going to mark right now. So this is the original height of the salt. Okay, so notice that the first level. So if you're going to increase, you know that B, C, and D cannot be the answer because those are showing B showing the same level. C and D are showing decrease. So if water is going in, there must be an increase. So option A will be our answer. Now let's move on to question number 13. And so question number 13 now reads, it said, which part of a leaf is correctly matched to its function? Now, palisade mesophyll. And so the palisade mesophyll is where you have the elongated cells, which are called palisade mesophyll cells. And they are really elongated and they contain the most chloroplast and the chloroplast responsible for photosynthesis. So this option here without it going any further will be our correct answer. But let's point out a few things here. Spongy mesophyll. Spongy mesophyll tightly packed, which is not true because the spongy mesophyll fill cells, they are loosely packed to allow easy diffusion of gases throughout the leaf, okay? Stomata is the opening of the leaf where um, gases could enter and gas could also exit, okay? So during photosynthesis, you have carbon dioxide going in and oxygen coming out, all right? And during the night or in the dark, when there's no light for photosynthesis, then more oxygen is going in for respiration and carbon dioxide will be coming out. Okay, just to point it out, the wax cuticle reduces water loss from the lower leaf surface. The main reason for wax cuticle is on the, most of the wax cuticle will be on the top of the leaf or the thickest part of wax cuticle will be on the top of the leaf will reduce the evaporation of water. So the top of leaf is the most effective part for wax cuticle. All right, so option A is definitely our answer there. Number 14, is so which substance is responsible for giving plants their green color? Let us go back a little bit more to the question. 
All right, and so chlorophyll here will be our correct answer. Chlorophyll is responsible for that. All right, auxin is a growth hormone. Starch is a store carbohydrate or a stored molecule. Sucrose is what is being transported through the plant. All right, so question number 15. Again, I went ahead and labeled um, the diagram to make it easier to save some time so you can look at the labelings, know what the labelings are. All right, so when, when you're practicing and studying, at least you know the parts of a kidney. Now, it's a diagram shows the internal structure of a human kidney. It's a which structure is responsible for transporting urine to the bladder. Okay, and here we're talking about um, the ureter. All right, so the ureter is A, structure A. So this will be our answer here, ureter. All right, so um, let me point out um, one thing here, at least one thing. So you're going to see the capsule, you're going to see the medulla, you're going to see the cortex. The cortex is the largest region. Now, I label the medulla twice, if you'll notice that. Option um, D, and also I put a open bracket here to show you the region, because the medulla is that region where you find these structures, right? On, within the medulla, you have the renal um, pyramid. So these triangular-looking structure, they will be the pyramid, and they are attached in the medulla. Okay, just point it out, the pelvis cavity. And also what I want to point out again is the renal artery, renal vein. The diagram did not have any arrows, so I just put arrow there for convenience purposes. The artery will always um, bring blood to the kidney, and then the renal vein will take blood away from it, going back towards the heart, okay? So just look out for your arrows, just in case you'll see diagrams like that in the examination. All right, so again, you can look at the labelings and make a no and make note of them. And so if you should see this, you know what to label and how to label your diagram. All right, number 16. And so for number 16, said which substance would be present in the urine of a healthy person? Amino acid should not be there because that's a part of a protein, so you not find that um, in the urine. Um, glucose. You should not be, um, glucose should not be in the urine, otherwise the person can be deemed as diabetic. Um, proteins, again, no, because the same thing as option A, because amino acid comes from protein. All right. And so you should not be seeing that. Generally, if you see proteins, more likely a person have a structure damage or probably an infection. All right, so urea is a part of urine. And just to point out that urine contain three main things you have urea salts and water so in urine you'll find urea you'll find salts and you'll find also water so those are the three major components of urine all right and urine and sweat has the um they have the same components urea salts and water just to make a note of that all right, let's jump on to question number 17 real quick it said, what is the name of the fluid that is found at a movable joint? We have done this in the, in the previous paper, and we talk about what you can be found at joints, and definitely we'll find synovial fluid. Okay? All right, great. Now, number 18. And also remember that synovial fluid is to lubricate the joint, and so it will reduce friction and cause smoother movement at the joints. Okay, let's jump into question number 18. Again, this diagram is pre-labeled for you, um, just to save some time here. And number 18 is saying now that the diagram shows a human brain, which label on the diagram points to the cerebellum. Of course, it's labeled, so that one will be straightforward over option D. Okay, all right. I notice the cerebrum, which is the largest part of the brain, um, cerebrum is for um, voluntary actions or conscious thoughts, all right? And cerebellum is for balance and coordination. Medulla oblongata, it is for involuntary actions, right? And the pituitary, and the pituitary gland is the master gland that control the other glands in the body. The spinal cord is important in terms of reflex action, all right? Just to point that out real quick, all right? And so let's jump on to question number eight, um, 19 now. And question number 19 now reads that the diagram shows a, 
a section of part of the human eye when looking at an object in two different positions, right? And so here now we have diagram P and diagram Q. It said, what has happened to cause the change in the lens? So notice they say the lens is changing um, from P to Q. So I want to notice the lens here. Let me just kind of highlight the lens right here. Notice the lens. Notice the difference in the lens in each case. In P, it is the lens is longer. And in Q, the lens is shorter. So they really want us to know that the object has moved from where to where. All right? So that's what we want to know. So let's point out something here real, real quick. Now, in P, when the lens is longer, what is happening there is because the object is at a far distance. Okay? The object is at a far distance. So this is far distance. Okay? And in Q is when the object is at a near distance. So what I want you to notice now, it's kind of easy to remember. The longer the lens, the, the further away the, the object is. The, the shorter the lens, the closer the object is. So short, short and thick lens, near object. Long and thin lens, far object. So kind of easy. The, length, the longer the lens, the further the object is. The, for, the, the longer the lens, the further the object is. Now, what is causing this? So, the point is out. We have the muscles that are connected here. They call it suspensory ligament, right? And attached to, behind the suspensory ligament, you'll have your ciliary muscles. So, when the lens get longer, the suspensory ligament they get shorter, which means they are contracting. And the opposite is true. When the, when the lens is shorter, it therefore means that the suspensory ligaments, the muscle, those, those are muscles, they get longer. Okay. So that's the point it out. So our option here for question 19 is moving from a very far object to a near object. And we can see our answer right there already, which is option B. All right, moving from a far to near. All right. So let's jump on to question number 20. All right, and in question number 20, here it reads that the diagram shows a respiratory system. It said use the diagram to answer question 20 and 21. Okay, so we're going to use this for two questions here. I already pre-labeled for you uh, just to save some time. So we have a track here. We have the bronchus. We have the alveoli, which are those small round sac at the end of the bronchioles. And then we have the diaphragm, which is a muscle that will control the movement of the lungs uh, up and down or to cause them to get smaller or increase pressure or decrease pressure. It depends on how the uh, diaphragm is moving. All right, another time we go through that in terms of the movement to cause inhalation and exhalation. But for now, it said, what is the function of the cartilage um, rings in P? And so we're asked, we, the question is asking you, what is the function of cartilage in the trachea? And remember, we also stated this in a previous um, review, is that the the cartilage will prevent the trachea from collapsing, especially when you're eating food. And so C will be our answer for number 20. Okay? All right, so number 21. Let's go to number 21. It said, which labeled structure shows where gaseous exchange takes place? And remember that gaseous exchange will take place at the alveoli. Okay? And remember, you need to know also the properties in terms of the structure of the alveoli that allow them to be effective for gaseous exchange. And so some of those will be, so R will be our answer there, let's look at R is. So some of the properties of the alveoli, they must be thin, they must be moist, must have a large surface area. So our answer here for question number 21 will be C, which is structure R, which is the alveoli, okay? All right, and please remember the properties of the alveoli to allow effective gaseous exchange, okay? So thin, moist, large surface area, and also covered with a lot of blood capillaries. All right, question number 22, it said, which rule shows the correct composition of expired air? So we're looking for expired air now. So let's eliminate some of the things that are not um, correct. Now, inspired air will be approximately 20 to 21%, right? 
So by this amount of oxygen, we know that C and D, they are actually out of the answer. Okay, so let's cross that out. All right. So the answer is between A and B. But let's look at this now carefully. The nitrogen remains the same for both, which is correct. The carbon dioxide um, coming out of the body is about 4%, so that's fine. Saturated with water. So if you blow onto a piece of glass or a mirror, you realize that it will smudge with water molecules. That means water is coming out, so that is also correct. But the amount of oxygen coming out is really approximately 16%, right? So it's not as low as 10. So about um, decrease in 4% here. Um, so the answer here will be B for 22. Okay, so this is a critical thing. 16% of oxygen is coming out compared to what is going in, which is 21. All right. Now, question number 23. Here it said, a, a human at complete rest has an energy usage of 4 kg, which is 4 kilojoules per minute. It said glucose has an energy value of 16 kilojoule per gram. Is it how long will it take? How long will one gram of glucose last as a source of energy? And this is us need to calculate in terms of how much you'll break down per minute, really. And so if the one gram is 16 kilojoule per 16 kilojoule per gram, right? Then what we need to look at now is that if you only use 4 grams per minute, then to work this out, what you will do, you will put, you will divide your 16 kilojoule per gram here. So it will be 16 divided by 4. Okay, and so if you divide 16 by 4, what you'll get here, you will also get 4. Okay, so the answer there is 4. All right, so option A will be our correct answer. All right, so let's jump on to question number 24. So question number 24 said, which of the following are necessary for the process of aerobic respiration to occur? And we know that aerobic respiration requires oxygen and requires glucose. And so definitely option b will be our answer okay all right and remember that all respiration requires glucose in it all right all respiration requires glucose all right all right so our next question here which is question number 25 so we're halfway there all right so the diagram represents an alveolus and its blood supply and we talk about alveoli earlier and another question and talk about the surface must must be thin, must be moist, must have a large surface area. So these folding allow a large surface area and covered with a lot of blood capillaries. But let's see what is asking here. It said, what process is represented by ROW? All right. And W is representing oxygen diffusing towards the blood vessel. So let's look at what um, is here. And so... It's the active transport of carbon dioxide, not true. Active transport of oxygen, not true. Um, diffusion of carbon dioxide, not true. But diffusion of oxygen is the correct answer. So 25 here is D. Now question number 26 now reads that which equation correctly represent anaerobic respiration? And when we talk about anaerobic respiration, a matter of fact, all respiration starts with glucose, okay? All respiration starts with glucose. That's the first thing you need to know. And so we talk about anaerobic respiration. There are two types. There are um, alcoholic fermentation or lactic acid fermentation. So option A is definitely out because it's carbon dioxide plus water. This is not true, okay? Um, glucose plus oxygen, this is aerobic respiration. And glucose in the ethanol, it is not totally correct because ethanol and carbon dioxide must be produced if it is alcoholic fermentation and so this will be the correct answer 26 is d glucose will break down into carbon into carbon dioxide plus ethanol and also energy okay so option d is our correct answer there for 26 now for 27 
going a little bit faster. All right, so, so which gas is needed to remove lactic acid made in the muscle during anaerobic respiration? So this is another anaerobic respiration. So this will be glucose breakdown into lactic acid only. Okay, so the, the reason in the first place why you will do lactic acid fermentation is because there's a lack of oxygen, okay? So you, you will go into a, in, into a phase that we call oxygen depth. That means you're, you're owing the body some oxygen. So to get rid of the lactic acid, you have to repay that oxygen. All right, and so oxygen is needed here. So 27 will be option C. All right, so let's go to question number 28. And question number 28, now we so said the diagram represents a longitudinal section of a flower. It's a use the diagram to answer question 28 and 29. Now again, um, this is already pre-labeled for you just to save some time. It's a which part of a flower is responsible for the production of male gametes. So producing male gametes. And male gametes is produced in the anther. Okay, so the anther here is structure S. So let's see where structure S is placed in our option. The anther, structure S, right. So option D will be our correct answer here. Now, again, let me go back to the flow one more time for you to see the labelings. So again, you can observe the labelings, um, know what they are, and so on. All right, so just to point out, I put anther and filament in blue because um, that's representing the male part of the flower, which is called a stamen. Stigma style ovary, I place those in green, and those that make up the female part of the flower, which is called a carpel or the pista. Okay? All right? And so you also need to know the function of the other parts. So please, you can just study that, make sure you know them and the importance of those other structures. All right, let's go to question number 29. It's a which structures make up the stamen, which we talk about the male part, and the male part is the anther and the filament. And the anther and filament here is S and R. So let's look at which options say S and R. So S and R here for question number 29. S and R, which is B, R and S. Okay, so option B is our correct answer here. All right, so let's go to question number 30. All right, so question number 30 is that the diagram represents a cross-section of a seed and so we have structure X, which is the radical. And the small leaflet portion will be your pumule. And this large portion here will be a cotyledon. And then you have a tester on the outside part. Okay. So, so what is the name of the part labeled X? And again, that is the radical, which will form the root system. So this will be B, the radical, which forms the root system of the plant. All right. So let's go to the next question here. Question number 31. And question number 31 now states now, it said, in addition to a suitable temperature, what else is necessary for seed germination? I think I've done this question about three or four times, right? And so the things that are necessary for germination of seeds Remember, you do not need light, you do not need carbon dioxide because the plant is not photosynthesizing at that time. All the food that the, that the seedling is getting is coming from the cotyledon within the seed. It stores in the seed. And so what is also important here, uh, we, we need water and we need oxygen. Remember that, right? And in some cases, the pH is also important. But when you talk about needing things that the, that the seed needs, is, is, um, it need the suitable temperature, water, and oxygen. All right, but a condition of correct pH is also good to maintain some seed germination. All right. Now, um, thirty-two. It said, which statement best describe um, describes homeostasis? And remember, we also did this question before. And once you maintain a constant condition in the body or internal condition in the body, that is homeostasis. So we could just jump to this one. Again, we have been through this question about a lot of times, I will say, yeah? Okay, so we could just jump to that one. All right. So uh, let's jump into question number 33. All right. So 33, now this one here um, speaks about 
the diagnosis, the response to changes in temperature of blood vessels near the surface of the skin. All right, so this is missing some parts here, right? It's not so clear, but let me just put this. The arrow is supposed to be on top of the um, diagrams showing you the release of heat, okay? So the release of heat, that means heat is coming out of the body. Um, these arrows on the right, they're actually larger and thicker than the one on the left. Okay, just put them in. You could see some of them um, slightly. All right, but that's not really important right now. What is important, right? What I want to point out is the thickness of these blood vessels, okay? And so what I wanted to notice here, that in diagram P, the blood vessels, they are thinner, and in Q, they are thicker. So what is represented here is that the, the blood vessel will change its size and release it accordingly. So important now, or, or what I may want to say here, right, is that in diagram P, the blood vessels are, th are thinner. What we call that condition vasoconstriction. So let me just type in that for you. So let me put it on the side right here. Vasoconstriction. So vasoconstriction. All right, so this is vasoconstriction. All right, so the blood vessel, it is getting narrow, all right, and moving away from the skin. And in this option here on this side, it's going to be vasodilation. Um, so this one is vasodilation. So the blood vessel is dilating, okay? And on the, the left side, it is constricting, which is getting narrower. All right, so now why the blood vessel get thicker or dilate is to release more heat from the body. Okay, so this is, Q is when you are, are hot, okay? You do that. And when you're colder, the body will, the blood vessel will constrict to retain heat in the body. So less heat is released from the body during P, more heat is released from the body during Q. So now in the question, I always want you to understand that, that part. And so he said, what is responsible for the change from P to Q? So if it's going to Q, that means your body is really getting hot, okay? So, the process that takes place in Q, again, it is vaso, let's go back to it, it is vaso what? Dilating, so vasodilation is in Q, so the, the blood vessel is dilating, okay? So, it's dilating there, and so since it's dilating, and the, the, what is causing the change is because your body temperature increases, so option D will be our answer. Your body get hotter, so you have to release that heat to the environment. All right, so option D will be your answer. Okay, could not be A and B because, again, you're not constricting, it's dilating from P to Q. Okay, and because the body temperature uh, rises, and you need to release that heat into the environment. And usually that process is um, associated with sweating as well, so you will normally sweat when that is occurring. Now, question number 34 here now read this. So what term describes the growth of a plant root towards gravity? And going towards gravity, it is geotropism. But since it's going towards the stimulus, then it's going to be a positive geotropism. All right? So, so when you talk about photo, phototropism, you're talking about going to light or, or away from light. So positive phototropism will mean going towards the light. Negative phototropism is going away from the light. All right? So just to point that part out. All right? And just to make also mention that the roots, they are negatively phototropic, while the shoot is positively phototropic. All right, let's go to question number 35 real quick. And the question number 35 is, uh, which hormone is needed for phototropism? In fact, this hormone is needed for all the tropic responses, and it is auxin. So auxin is a growth hormone that allows plants to grow towards or away from a stimulus. All right? And so let's jump into 36. All right, and 36 states now, so which gland is incorrectly matched with the hormone it produces? And if you look in the, the chart carefully, you now will realize that adrenaline 
is produced by the adrenal gland and so it's not produced by the pituitary gland so we can say this is is their answer right here it is incorrectly matched insulin is produced by the pancreas and insulin will decrease the glucose level in the blood and convert convert the glucose into glycogen that is stored in the liver estrogen is produced by the ovary in females definitely progesterone is also produced in the ovary so those are um, correct answers all right so let's go to 37 it said which hormone prepares the body for action in emergency situation and adrenaline is that hormone is the flight or fright hormone adrenaline all right so option a for 37 is our correct answer now question number 38 all right so 38 it said which artery carries deoxygenated blood and the pulmonary artery is the only artery in the body that carries deoxygenated blood so right off the bat here we know our answer there is c now for question number 39 they said what is the function of white blood cells called phagocyte and phagocyte they have irreg irregularly shaped nucleus so you can identify them by that and so the nucleus is irregularly shaped and so therefore um, the process of phagocytosis will take place in other words the, the the white blood cells will engulf the bacteria and digest them so option b will be your answer here i right, know for number 40. let's go to number 40. all right so number 40 is at which shows the correct pathway for the circulation of blood in mammals and I want you to remember this. An easy way for you to, to, to master any circulation question in the examination is simple to write this on a piece on your paper. Um, Av love B. So let's do this real quick for you. So A V, um, so Av, I'll put a little bit of space there. L A V again. And then B. Now the reason for this is simple because um we represent an a by the atrium so a will represent the atria v ventricle l lungs and b is the body and so blood will go from here um all the way over to the lungs and then from the lungs back here so this is a very summary easy easy way to do an exam so you can follow how blood is flowing and then you go like that and then it will come from the body all the way back into A. So let's carry this all the way back to A. And so this is our blood circulation. Very, very simple. Now, um, there's a point out one thing here, right? Real quick, is that, um, let me put this in, in red so it's easier to, okay, awesome. All right, so what I want to show you now, now, right, is this. To understand A, B, and L and B, now remember if you're in an examination situation, right? What you will do is your left hand will be the right side of the body. So, so this first AV will be the right side of the body because that's where your left hand will be. And on the other side of the heart here, your right hand will be over this side. So this will be the left side of the heart, right? And so if you should follow this carefully, let's start from the body. So blood moves from the body into the right atrium, then to the right ventricle, then to the lungs, then to the left atrium, then to the left ventricle, then back to the body. And we should know the parts or the blood vessels that are responsible for that, right? So also remember that arteries take blood away from the heart, veins take blood into the heart, and also the arteries, they, um, the, the atria, they receive blood. The ventricles will push blood out of the heart. Okay, so let's go into this now. So follow a diagram. It said left ventricle which is here, so right, left ventricle into the body, which is correct, then to the right atrium. Wow, that there is good. Okay, so you notice again, let's go to option A. Left ventricle, which is here, so our left ventricle, let's put something here. So our left ventricle, then our left ventricle goes into the body, then from the body goes into the right atrium. So you notice here, option A is the answer, see? What you can also do is you follow this pathway and look at the other options. Um, so you can pause and look at it and see if they checked out. So let's just do one more. 
and then I move on to question number 41, right? Let's look at the left ventricle. Left ventricle is here. This is for option B. So left ventricle first. Then it goes to the lungs, which is going backwards, which is not correct. So we, there we could know that this is totally wrong, okay? So again, you can go through all of them to actually see if you understand this Avlov B diagram. But it's easy way out of any circulation. Very easy. All right, number 41 here. It said, which food listed below is less likely to contribute towards coronary heart diseases? And it's a less likely. So anything with less fat and it is more healthy for the body, um, contain a lot of fiber and so on, will be the correct choice. So for the one here has to be oatmeal. Eggs um, will have some fat. French fries have fat. Red meat, um, high cholesterol and so on. So definitely our option C is a correct. Oatmeal is a healthy choice right there. Okay. All right. So let's go to 42. And we should be out of here real soon. All right. So 42, he said, which marine mollusk is typically found in the Bahamian diet? And conch is a big thing. So conch is a mollusk. All right. Nassau group is a fish. So, all right. And so we have our crustaceans and so on. So um, queen conch is the only mollusk that is shown right here. All right, so 42 is option B. All right, let's go to or another option here, question. And so question 43. All right, and so the diagram represents a map showing the major fishing areas of the Bahamas. Um, it said which fishing area is labeled A. And it's, the diagram is very difficult to see. Again, it is um, my device can in this not picking up the background, which is a darker portion. And so... This is where A is, and so I'm going to point out one place here that is Cuba. And so this is going to help us now to kind of figure out where this is. Again, I do not know all the regions um, based on the map. You know, I just know of very few things. Um, San Salvador is shown somewhere right here. Oh, my God, that's a beautiful place. Wonderful place. It's, it's, it's really nice. So some of these family islands, they are, oh, my God, marvelous. Um, so trust me, if you have time to go on one of these islands, you'll be so amazed by the natural environment the beautiful blue waters anyway let's not get to get into that i'm getting really excited but yeah it's a wonderful place in san salvador some nice beaches excellent um food and so on all right so anyhow um near near to cuba all right again i do not know all the regions all right and it said which fishing area is labeled a so near to um cuba um, what you'll get near the Cuba there, you'll find a great Bahama Bank. Not Grand Bahama Bank, but the Great Bahama Bank. Okay. Again, you can you can go on in, into the map and you'll figure them out. Or you can ask your geography teacher to actually assist you with, with these um regions. I don't know all, so I cannot go through all of them to say, okay, this is that bank, that bank, that bank, whatever. I really do not know all of them. But um Trust me, some of those places, though, I will tell that they are paradise, really. They are really lovely. Anyway, question number 44. Um, question number 44 here now reads that the graph shows the quality of various reef fish that were exported over a three-year period. And so when you look at the graph carefully, some of the lines are actually faded. Um, but the important thing you can see, Gruntwood is the empty box. Grupo, which is the last um, bar, and those will be the bigger circles here. The one in the X will be snapper. The one in the small dots will be the, the turbot. All right. So here now he said, which fish was exported in the largest quantity over the three years? Um, over the three years. So by looking at the graph, you will realize, really, you will realize that looking for the highest points. Yeah. So grouper here will have the highest point for um, here number three. Here, number two, grouper is not so bad. It's kind of average right there. And grouper is also the highest in one. So by just averaging out these numbers, so four plus three plus five, you're going to realize if you add up any others, there will be less. By just looking at the graph, you actually see it, by the way, right? Because even by looking at the, 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 the turbid, it's actually low here, um, low here, and only near two is actually high, right? And so by, by just looking at the, the diagram, you notice that the grouper is the one that will be the, the, the highest one or the highest average, right? And so um, let's go to Grupo. So Grupo will be your answer right there. 
All right, just by looking at the graph, you see that. That's that's kind of easy um, calculation. If you just calculate them if you want, and you will see the results. It looks like number 45. All right, so number 45 here now, it reads that as a result of mitosis, mitosis, one parent cell produces which of the following? So mitosis produce um, only two daughter cells with the same number of chromosomes, right? Um, meiosis, on the other hand, produces four daughter cells with half the number of chromosomes. And so we're looking here for two daughter cells. So 45 will be option B. So mitosis, two daughter cells with the same number of chromosomes as the parent cell. Meiosis will produce four daughter cells with half the number of chromosomes compared to the parent cell. That's right, so 45, there is B. All right, now look at 46. It said 46 reads now which type of cell division results in daughter cells with haploid number of chromosomes. Now, the word haploid means half the number of chromosomes. So diploid means full number of chromosomes, right? So let's put the word diploid there for you. Um, so if you haven't heard that word before, you know you know it. Diploid and haploid, okay? So diploid will mean full number of chromosomes. So full number, I just want to put that in short. Full number of chromosomes. Haploid means half the number of chromosomes. Half the number of chromosomes. So let's put half number right there, right? Haploid half. So it's my H for half, okay? All right. And so it's so a which type of cell vision will produce half the number of chromosomes. Looking for here now um, anything that go undergo meiosis. So meiosis is the answer. So 46 here is C. Budding is a sexual reproduction and is gone through mitosis. Um, fission is also an asexual um, process takes place in bacteria. And that also is a mitosis producing um, the, the full number of chromosomes, which is diploid. Okay, so option C. So mitosis, budding, and fission, they are the same thing in terms of number of production of chromosomes or a type of cells that are produced. Now in 47, it's a diagram shows an Irish potato stem tuber. And now we have a new sprout coming off the potato. And so this here is a form of asexual reproduction. They say which type of reproduction is shown. So it's asexual. And since the plant and it's producing new sprout, it's going to be vegetative reproduction. So it is not binary fission that's taking place in bacteria. Mark cutting is what they call air layering. All right. And commonly called in the Bahamas mossing. Sexual reproduction, you, you require different um, gametes, male and female. And so D will be your answer right here. All right, see, we're almost at the end of it. All right, almost there, almost there. So 48. Now, in 48, now it's a diagram represents a birth control device. And so this device is one of the older model of this type of device. And it's called the inter intrauterine device. Let me put that here intrauterine device and so um the, the the abbreviation for this is iud so this is an iud so if you see iud is mean the same thing intrauterine device now we said how does this device work and so this is inserted inside of a female um, vagina up to the, the the cervix normally the commonly the commonly used one now they are T-shapes, and even they move from T-shapes onto even some smaller microscopic head. And so they're very useful in preventing the eggs from coming into the uterus. So you go all the way up, we we'll, we'll, we'll block the fallopian tubes, and so the eggs will not be able to come and implant themselves inside of the uterus. So the option here will be B, okay? So the option here will be B, all right? So it prevents implantation of eggs. All right, prevents the implantation of eggs into the uterus. So notice it's an intrauterine device. So the uter the uterine or the uterus, I should say, will be blocked. All right, from the egg will be blocked from the uterus. All right, so 49 here now reads that which is an example of a discontinuous variation within a population of human beings. Discontinuous means you either have it or you don't. That means it's only two, it's only two um, options. All right? It's not a continuation. So you have continuous um, variation, which means there's a change over a period of time, or it can be changed by the environment. All right? So 
in terms of discontinuous, here now, the blood group is the correct answer because you're born in that blood group and that will not be changed or influenced by the environment. Um, so here, color can be changed over a period of time. So you can start with dark hair, for example, and then eventually become white or we call gray hair, right? Or your hair could be dark and then because of exposure to chemicals or to the sun, um, it could be changed to a little bit browner and so on. Your skin color again can be a, can be changed depending on the external environment that you're exposed to. If you're in the sun for a long period of time, it could become darker and darker and so on. And if you're away from the sun, you can get a little bit lighter. Okay. Weight can also be changed over a spectrum because um depending on the amount of food you eat and depends on other things as well. Um, your weight can also change as while you're growing as well, your weight is also changing. So those are continuous. Now, our final question here said, the diagram shows the possible genotype of offspring from a black fur rat and a brown fur rat. It's a litters of rats resulting from a cross between black fur and brown fur rats. And it asks here which genotype should be placed in the empty box. And so again, you go by column and rows. So here we have two small Bs, which mean homozygous recessive. All right, they give it a key here to talk about um, big B is for black, small B is for brown, which means black is dominant over brown. All right, and so we just have to in two small Bs. That means the missing one there is homozygous recessive. So two small Bs, option D is our answer. And we're at the end of this review. And again, turn to people, please read the questions carefully. Study hard, do well. I know the exam is not far away. So until that time, hopefully I do some more reviews, especially some paper threes. All right, so I might do one more paper two and just put in some paper threes as quickly as I possibly can. So looking forward for, to see you here again. Be safe. Take care of yourself, all right?